I'm glad we're having this important discussion and want to welcome all of you to a family town hall on COVID-19 with Vice President Biden, Dr. Joe Biden, and former Surgeon General Dr. Murphy. We're also joined by three families who documented their lives here on YouTube. Curtis and Duana are parents to three, a family of five from Georgia, whose YouTube channel, The Curly Coopers, is centered around their family and faith. Next, we have Jeremy and Isaac. They are a father and son whose family currently resides in Puerto Rico. They document their family life on their YouTube channel, J, Vlog, J House Vlogs. Finally, we are joined by Benji and Judy Travis, who upload daily videos mm -hmm. of their life with their daughters in Seattle on their YouTube channel, It's Judy's Life. We're going to be taking this time to answer your questions regarding the current COVID outbreak. Now it is my honor to turn it over to Dr. Jill Biden and Vice President Biden, who will get us started. Thanks, right. Michelle. And uh, I love your sweater with the flag on it. That looks great, yeah. And I love that you're on Team Biden as well. Um, so my name is Jill and this is my husband, Joe. And uh, your children may not know, but we have three children and we have six grandchildren. And uh, so we've watched several episodes of, um, of you know, your shows. And I love the way uh, your kids interact with each other, with one another, and the way they interact with you. I think this is, um, you know, such a tough time for families to be going through. But I can see that really the children bring so much joy Um into your lives. And I think that's really what we need uh, to get through these uh, trying times is joy and, and kindness. And I can see that your children are very kind to one another. I think that's one of the things Joe and I try to uh, instill in our own children. And uh, so anyway, I, I really compliment you as parents because I know how tough it is. And um so I just wanted to, and, and if the kids have questions, they can call us Nana and Pop. So it doesn't <laughs> feel so formal because that's what we're used to. So anyway, thanks for joining us. And, um, uh, you know, we're happy to see all of you. Am I supposed to say something now? Yeah, you can say <laughs> something. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. It's great to see you all. You have a really great podcast, all, all the families. You make so many people happy. You give a lot of people confidence. Look, this is a tough time. And uh, it's, a, it's a really tough time around the world, uh, not just here in the United States. And it's particularly confusing, I think, for kids. At least uh, we have grandchildren that range in age from seniors in law school to little infants. And, uh, and uh, the fact is that it's even confusing for some of them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the thing I want to say to everybody is, you know, we, uh, my, my dad used to say that, you know, out of everything bad, something good will come if you look hard enough for it. And uh, this is not. There's nothing happy about this virus. There's nothing happy happy about what's happening to some people. But you know, as long as you keep listening to the docs, listen to the scientists, the parents are doing it, keeping social distance outside your home and inside your home with other people. That if they come in the house, for example, kids, we have um, because I'm running for president, we have secret service all around the house. And uh, when anybody comes in the house, they put on a mask and they put on gloves and they come in and they want to make sure that we're not uh, communicating any uh, any possibility of the disease. But look, here's the deal. You have a lot of friends out there who are also confused and a lot of them don't have the mommies and daddies you have. A lot of them don't have the kind of tight families you have. A lot of them are in more difficult situations. So I want you to think about them. Think about your friends who are in school still, not in school, but you go to school with and kids you know that don't have as much. Uh, they're, some of them are really scared. Some of them are really worried and they're not sure where this is all going to go. But you know, it's amazing that, you know, what moms and dads are always able to do, especially in your families is give people hope, give not just you guys the hope and let you guys know things are going to get better. And by the way, I'm learning a lot like you all. Here I am. I'm used to being in a television studio or out standing before a couple thousand people talking. And here I am in my basement in a television studio. <laughs> <laughs> We've not done that before. So I'm trying to learn too. And an awful lot of stuff you're doing online, but you're kind of more used to it than I am. Whenever I have, whenever I have a problem, 
anything I have to do with my computer or going online, I call one of my granddaughters. They're, they're the ones that settle it for me. But all kidding aside, there's a really, we got to take advantage and try to look at the things that this is exposing us to that are good. We're getting to see how good people can be to one another. We're getting to see how people reach out, not just not physically reach out and grab people, but how they reach out and call their friends. For example, one of the things that, that we do and, uh, and Nana does, and we uh, set up a, a cancer institute for people who are dealing with fighting cancer. And uh, we set up an initiative that has uh, had a lot of important Nobel laureates and people on it. But we also have a piece of that committee that deals with trying to make sure that people are able to navigate when they're sick. They know who to call, where to go, how to get things done, get help. And so uh, Jill is working on a project with one of the women who organizes that for us in, in our in this foundation that uh, we're picking up the phone and calling people and saying, you're OK, you're not alone. We're sending emails to them, letting people know that we're out there because this this will this will get over. We have a, an awful lot of incredible scientists. You're going to hear from Dr. Murtha in a minute. He's a good friend of mine. Calls me every morning with some other doctors and give me an hour, anywhere from a half an hour to an hour brief on all that's going on around the world. But the point I want to make to you is that we have to look at what can the good come out of this. This is, a, this is an opportunity to deal with making sure that we as a, all Americans, that we, that we're nicer to one another, that we that pay more attention to people's problems, that we, in fact, there's a lot of kids, as I said, and parents have been through a lot. And to say to the parents, you and I know uh, we're a little better off than most, but how about all those people who are, you know, the single moms who are, uh, have, uh, you know, they're out of their job now. They're wondering how in God's name are they going to pay the rent payment? How are they going to make sure that, or if it's a couple or not a couple, a single parent, how are they going to pay the mortgage payment? What's going to happen? How, how do we take care of, like, for example, in dealing with kids doing homeschooling, a lot of you are very, very good at it, but a lot of people don't even have the broadband connections that are get the high speed internet to their homes. They don't have computers. So there's some kids that are and families that are more disadvantaged than others. So only thing I want to say is we're anxious to a try to answer your questions, but I'm confident. I'm confident we're all going to get through this. Some people are going to get hurt. We got to make sure that we take care of the people who are in trouble, not just now, but after this is all over. There's a lot we have to do. We can do much better than we've done so far in dealing with this problem. And I believe we're going to be able to do that. So why don't I, as my mom used to say, hush up and, uh, and, and take some of your questions. Or actually, both of us take some of your questions. Thank you so much, Vice President Biden. And Michelle, and by the way, you are incredible. You are <laughs> incredible. No, I really mean it. This is one of the most, most talented skaters in the history of the sport. You're looking at it right now. But she has a heart <laughs> as big as her talent. She is all over the country, going all over the country, giving people confidence, giving people hope, giving letting people know what we can do as a, as, as, as a country. And this is an incredible country. We're of all different backgrounds, all of us, but we're all one. And Michelle, you are absolutely magnificent, all you do, really and truly. Thank My you. My honor. Um, I know that the families have a ton of questions. Okay. Uh, I would like to kick it off to the Curly Coopers, uh, Cur Curtis and Duana. Um, I know you have a, a couple of questions for the VP and Dr. Biden. Yeah, so I just going to ask the first question. Will we be able to go on a, to a trip in Europe in June? Well, I don't know you'll be able to do it in June, honey, but I tell you what, your daddy and mommy, I promise you're going to be able to take you to Europe. Whether they're able to do it in June remains to be seen. Now I'm putting you on the spot, mom and dad, but I, uh, but I, I'm not sure that may be a little early. It may not occur until the end of the summer, or maybe even later. And uh, but I promise you're going to get there. Where in Europe were you going to go? Well, my husband uh, was born in Germany, so we were going to start in Paris and then work our way to Germany for a week. But um, yeah. Where, where in Germany were you born? Steinfurt. Yeah, uh, been there. 
Germany's oh. a beautiful country, but I th- I don't think you're going to want to leave Paris. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bad part of going to Paris first. But you're oh, going to okay. find Germany is a magnificently beautiful country as well. So oh, yeah. you guys will get to go. You have your question. What will we do? What will wait? What can we do to prevent this from happening again? Well, that's a that's a really good question. Look, one of the things that we're learning, and your generation uh, is going to be the best educated generation in the history of the world, just like the young millennials are now. You're going to be so much more advanced in access, access to science and technology and all the things that have to be done to deal with this in the future. But there's these things are called there's a virus. And a virus is what we're dealing with now, a, 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 a particularly lousy kind of virus. It's like flu on steroids. It's a really bad, bad kind of flu. And uh, that's not a technical term, but that's kind of how you think about it. And one of the things we learned is that these, the, these kind of diseases, they don't, you can't build a wall. You can't say it can't come into the United States. It can only be in this country or that country. It crosses borders and from one country to another, and there's no way to stop it except to know it's coming. And so one of the things that we did, that President Obama and I did, we set up a system after we dealt with something similar to this in Africa. It was called a bowl. It was a, I don't want to confuse you. But what we did was we set up, there's a thing called the Center for Disease Control. Your parents can explain these to later. And we put Americans in other countries from this organization to detect when things were happening in other countries. So we'd get, we'd hear in advance what was happening. That's number one. Number, so we could be prepared. Number two is we should be spending a lot more money on research, research by our scientists to deal with like vaccinations for this. There ought to be ways in which to prevent many of these diseases from being able to affect you. Like, like occurred in a lot of other diseases. Not the same thing, but like polio. You end up having polio shots and people aren't dying of polio as much. So there's ways in which we have such incredible capacity now. And, and I don't want to get into all the detail, but the point is that we have, we have the technology to be able to look down the road and see the kinds of things we should be preparing to stop, to be able to keep from getting out of the box, out of affecting so many people. And lastly, we have to develop these vaccines and ability to quickly test people if there's another virus like this gets developed. Because the quicker we can test people, we can keep them out of the way of a lot of other people. You don't have to lock them up, but they can not be interfacing with a whole lot of people and big, you know, city swimming pools or hanging out in concerts or movie theaters. And we can prevent things from happening by identifying quickly whether or not someone has the problem, has the disease. And maybe Dr. Murthy has something he wants to add to that. Well, sure. Doctor, you you. want to add anything to that? Sure. So thank you for the the question. I, I think the vice president said it well. The bottom line is we can't always control what diseases come up in the world, but we can control how we prepare for them and how we react to them. And if we have stronger healthcare systems, if we have better science so that we can have medicines and vaccines, then we can be better prepared the next time this comes around. The truth is it will come around again, something like this, because we know and the vice president uh, and Dr. Biden know that every few years we have a virus like this, not as bad as it as this one, but every few years a virus like this comes around. And so we've got to be prepared the next time this happens. Thank you for answering that question for us. Oh, sorry, I had to lay Zai's eye down for a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Understand. <laughs> we remember. Thank you, Dr. Murthy, and thank you, Curly Coopers. Uh, next, I'd like to turn it over to Jeremy and Isaac of J House Logs, who also have a couple of questions. Yeah, all of this really started hitting home for us. We got a call from my mom and my stepdad who are in their 60s and 70s, and they told us that they were diagnosed with COVID-19. And that that started really getting me looking closer at the mortality rate, which seems there's a lot of conflicting information on that. And so I was wondering what your take is on what is the mortality rate and what 
medications or treatments would you recommend to help as people are getting this disease to give them the best chance? I get that brief every morning from Dr. Murthy, but doctor, why don't you begin that answer? Sure. Well, first of all, Jeremy, I'm so sorry to hear about your mom and dad. How are they feeling right now? They seem to be doing better. Their doctor did um, have them prescribed on hydroxychloroquine. I don't know if I said that right, but um, you know, we, we've been able to see them moving around and they seem to be doing well. We just have heard reports of how quickly it can turn bad. And so we keep calling and checking in and making sure that they're doing their daily calls to the doctor and really watching it closely. But right now, from everything we can tell, it looks like things are improving instead of deteriorating. Well, that's really reassuring to hear, Jeremy. Uh, I know you've probably been listening to the news and hearing that people who are older are more at risk, and that's true. And you've probably also been hearing that this is a much more severe illness than the flu, which is also true. But but there is some good news. Uh, The first is that the vast majority of people who get COVID-19 get better. And that includes the majority of people who end up having to be hospitalized. I'm grateful that your parents are not in that category. And it's a really positive sign that they're continuing to get better. But the second bit of good news here is that because this is such a crisis for the world, we have scientists all over the world who have come together to work as hard as they can to find a medication that could treat this virus and to ultimately develop a vaccine. Now, we don't have a medicine yet. There are medicines like hydroxychloroquine, which are being experimented with to see if they might help. They might, they may not. We don't know yet. And hopefully we'll find out soon. But in this time, like when we don't yet have a medicine, the most important thing we can do is to make sure that number one, they're getting plenty of rest. Number two, that they're staying hydrated and well-nourished in terms of their food intake. Number three, I would would never forget how important it is for them to have emotional support. Uh, And that's why I'm so glad that they have you and that they've got your family to support them, to be there for them. We know now that our mental health is deeply connected to our physical health. And if they've got what they need for their bodies, if they've got the support from you, then I think that they're going to be uh, well on their way to recovery. I think that last point is important. Have you. Yeah. It's really important to reach out. Yeah, we, uh, we live far away. We're here in Puerto Rico and my mom's in Arizona, but I do have a sister who's there and they've been dropping off groceries and doing what they can to help them in any way possible. So we're really happy that they're right by family. Yeah. So you got family sitting right next to you. <laughs> I, you got to be patient. We dads are hard to raise. So be patient. Okay. okay. And All Isaac, right. their, his siblings are outside playing. <laughs> Good. We know we Jeff, do you have any other questions? Or is that yeah. the one? Yeah, Isaac had a question he wanted to ask. We know we should wash our hands and stay home, but what other advice would you give to people going through this right now? Well, first of all, make sure when you're outside, even in the yard, with if any of the kids come up or around, just don't get too close. Just we got to stay away from one another for a while. And that's number one. Number two, make sure that you, in fact, if you're going to sneeze, you don't just sneeze. You sneeze into your arm like I'm putting my hand up now. You got to make sure that you, in fact, make sure you, you're, you're, you're eating a good diet. I'm sure your mom and dad are taking care of that for you, but you got to eat, as the as old joke goes, you got to eat your vegetables. Um, and, uh, and number three, uh, you know, make sure you get rest. Don't get overtired. Don't get overtired. And uh, one of the ways to do that is to vary your day a little bit, too, because you're probably doing some online stuff. Are you doing anything for school right now? Uh, Yeah, I am. I'm doing all my, like, Spanish and math as well as, like, a lot of reading. Well, good for you, man. Mrs. Biden's a school teacher, an educator, and uh, you just made her smile. (laughs) (laughs) Are you getting exercise as well? What are you doing for exercise? Sometimes we like bike a little bit or like we have a trampoline. So well, that's helpful. Uh-huh. Well, oh, good. 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 Yeah, good. that's what we we both have bikes and we've been uh, going out on our bikes or taking walks and just to get outside and get some fresh air. You know, it just lifts your spirits. I think once you're in the house all day, or if you're hearing the news so much, it's just, you know, nice to take a break from it once in a while, I think. Well, thank you, Jeremy and Isaac. Our thoughts are with you and wish your mother the best. She covers um, 
finally, we have a, a couple of questions from Benji and Judy Travis of It's Judy's Life. Okay. Hello, Mr. Vice President and Dr. Biden. Thank you so much for taking time. Hi. To chat with us. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm a mommy vlogger on YouTube, mm -hmm. and I have a lot of um, uh, people that watch us that are expectant moms, or they have um, toddlers at home, and I just want to know what extra precaution should we be taking as expectant mothers. I'm also expecting my fourth daughter. Oh, congratulations. congratulations. Yeah. I have Thank five you. girls in my family. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I, I might need tips um but all, not only for expectant mothers but mothers with infants and newborns um what kind of tips can you give us and uh extra precaution tips well i'm going to ask dr mercy yeah. to, because he and i have talked about that on the phone before and there's some evidence that uh, as i understand it doctor that uh that Expectant mothers, their children, their babies are no more at risk. Of their, but why not I let the doctor speak to that? Well, thank you, sir. And first of all, congratulations, Judy. So excited for you uh, about the wonderful addition to your new family that's coming. Uh, and I'm so glad that uh, moms out there who are expecting have you uh, as, a, as a source of information. I know this is a really scary time uh, for new moms and for new dads who are worried about uh, the health of their child. And the good news is that so far there isn't evidence of bad outcomes uh, for newborns uh, whose mothers have COVID-19. But we've got to be really careful with pregnancy. We know that pregnant moms, that their immune system tends not to be as good as fighting off infection uh, as a mother who's not pregnant. Uh, and we also know that we're learning every day about this virus and what it does. So we've got to, I think, approach pregnancy with an abundance of caution. And that means that the that things we're asking people to do in terms of washing their hands regularly, not touching their face when they go outside, making sure you're at least six feet away from people who are outside of your immediate family at home, and also making sure that you're just not going out as much as possible, that certainly you're not going to crowds, but you're avoiding interactions with people uh, who you may not know, you know where they've been from. Uh, these are all the more important uh, when you're pregnant. One other thing I want to mention here is that I know that for many pregnant women, going to the doctor for your prenatal visits might be more scary in a time like this when you're hearing about COVID-19 everywhere and you don't want to interact with other patients who may be sick. But what I would encourage you to do is to, to call your doctor and to tell them, number one, that you want to know what sort of measures are being taken uh, around the office to keep you safe and to make sure that you won't be in a crowd of patients in the living room or rather in the waiting room. Uh, and I would also ask them what resources are available to do visits by phone or be via telemedicine. And we can't always do visits, you know, from remote, but sometimes there are some issues or concerns that we can take care of from afar. So all this to say that, you know, we, we have good reason right now, at least to believe that pregnant moms should be okay, but we've got to be cautious, extra cautious with them. We want you to be okay. We want your uh, child to be okay. And hopefully if we take these precautions, if you stay in touch with your doctor, ask the questions that you've got the right to ask, uh, hopefully everyone will come through this uh, and do okay. Thank you, doctor. Uh, but what about ex uh, mothers that have infants and maybe they have flu-like symptoms, but don't have, aren't positively tested with COVID-19? What kind of precautions should they do with their baby and in terms of breastfeeding, for example? That's a great question, Judy. I'm, I'm glad you asked. So right now, uh, there is no restriction uh, that public health authorities have issued about not breastfeeding your child if you're concerned that you may have COVID-19 or even if you have it. Uh, what we are recommending is that before you breastfeed your child that you actually wear a mask since you'll be in close proximity uh, to the baby. And we're also recommending that you make sure you're washing your hands uh, on a regular basis, especially before you hold your baby to breastfeed. You know, I, I have two small kids at home myself. I've got a, a three-year-old and a two-year-old uh, at home, and our two-year-old is, is still nursing. And so we are thinking about a lot of these uh, concerns as well. Uh, I think for moms as well who want to protect their kids, for dads as well, it's really important that uh, as parents that we observe a lot of these uh, restrictions about staying at home and about limiting our contact with other people. Uh, because, you know, we don't know where other people have been and who they've been in contact with. So we've got to be cautious. But again, wash your hands, wear a mask when you're breastfeeding your child. 
And but as far as we know right now, children actually seem to do quite well uh, when it comes to the virus. They seem to be at much lower risk uh, of bad outcomes compared to adults and people who are uh, have uh, other illnesses like diabetes or high blood pressure. Thank you. All right, I got a question. Uh, hello, my name is Benji Travis, uh, Mr. Vice President. It's an honor to be speaking with you, uh, Dr. Biden, as well. Thank you. We really appreciate what you guys are already doing for this country. And uh, my, both uh, my wife and I, we, we are military brats. So both of our fathers served in the Navy 20 years as chiefs. Um, and it's really important to serve the government and this country and the chief, mm -hmm. uh, commander in chief. However, to be honest, what they're really protecting is their families, right? Their communities. And so with the government supporting, uh, you know, with the stimulus, how are they gonna make sure, how are you gonna make sure that that money, that financial support is gonna get to the working families of this country and not just fill the pocketbooks of CEOs and corporations and make sure to get this country going in the right direction. Well, um, before Joe starts, I just wanna say, Benji, thank you for your service. Um, we too are a military family. My father served at Navy in World War II and our son, Bo, was uh, Army National Guard. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you for your service and for yours too, because what, you know, if you have a family member who serves, you, the whole family serves. So thank you. Uh, again, thank you for your service. The proudest thing our son, who was the Attorney General of the State of Delaware, did was put that uniform on. Yeah. Spent a year in Iraq. Before that, he spent almost seven months in in uh, in Kosovo, uh, and uh, he left as a major, highly decorated, and uh, he's really proud of it. I'm sorry to brag about my son, our son, but uh, <laughs> Not at all. I, we're incredibly proud of him, both of them. And look, um, uh, the most important thing to think about is as the commander in chief, and <clears throat> that's what the president of the United States is. The commander in chief uh, has, in this case, dealing with this COVID-19, he has, he has an army and his army are, his generals are the doctors and the nurses and everyone else who is taking care of making sure people are together, whether the military or not. And one of the things that he has, he has a great opportunity to be able to use a power called the Defense Production Act. And under that act, it is, was, can be used in wartime, but he can implement it any time when there's a crisis. And he is able to go to existing corporations or centers, businesses and say, look, we want you to stop making automobiles. We want you to make, as he did with General Motors, finally, we want you to start making respirators because we don't have enough in the United States of America or around the world to keep people alive when they're in the hospital. He can use that same power now to make sure that the first responders have the gloves, have the masks, have the gowns, have the, have the shields on their faces. And I, quite frankly, he's been awful slow in getting that going. And we should be much more aggressive in being able to do that. Thirdly, when you talk about what the money that was passed to help people who are in economic distress. Oh, no, I'm just my oh <laughs> and uh, uh, in, in, in economic distress. One of the things that when I put together this 19 point plan is suggesting what should be done because I'm no longer in the United States Congress is that the money for corporate America as only for one reason, there's of the $2 trillion, 500 billion of that is for corporate America, but it's for one express purpose. The employees, not the CEOs, not the stockholders, not being able to buy back your stock, it's for the employees. And as a matter of fact, they set up on that system, we're having a little bit of a tussle with the White House now, what they call an inspector general. And that is an outside expert who comes in and watches over exactly how the money is spent and reports on how it was spent. I, the reason I know something about this, when we were going through the economic crisis when the market crashed, financial crash, I got put in charge of the $900 billion Recovery Act, which was one that kept us from going into depression. And every single solitary day, I was on the telephone 
five, six, seven times a day with governors and senators and congresspersons telling them how they could spend it, what they could use it for, and putting together an inspector general as well as an entire organization within the White House so everybody knew where to go to get an answer immediately when they figured, well, how am I going to get what I've been promised? So the whole idea in the corporate side is to keep people employed, to keep them employed. Now, there's a second piece, and I know this is not what you asked, but it relates. The second piece is that an awful lot of people who the vast majority of the employers in America are small businesses. And a lot of small businesses are getting hurt very badly. They have to shut down a whole range of things. And so they set up, the Congress set up a proposal where you, the small business can go out and borrow money to stay afloat, to keep their businesses going. And if they keep their employees on the payroll, let's say I'm going to make it easy for me. If they borrow $10 and that's to pay their rent and to keep their supplies, et cetera. And in addition to that, they're going to keep $4 for that to keep employees on the, on the payroll. Guess what? When they pay it back, they only have to pay back $6. They don't have to pay back anything that, but here's the problem. A lot of banks are not used to, they're good folks, but they're not used to getting money out the door quickly for small businesses. And so there has to be a sense of urgency of getting the money out the door so people are okay. The last piece is this, the, this unemployment insurance. We have the, the, the Congress at the suggestion of, well, many people, myself included, um, has made it, you can be whole, made whole in your state. If, in fact, you are making up to $75,000 a year, what will happen is the unemployment rate that, you're, that you'd get in your state for having been employed would be added to the, on top of that another $600 so that you would be made whole up to a salary of $75,000. If, in fact, but the hard part is because of the gigantic increase in unemployment claims, over 3 million recently, the, the, the unemployment agencies in each of the states aren't ready to be able to get it out the door quick enough. So that's why they put money in for a half billion dollars to help train people to go immediately in to add people to the unemployment office so people get their check get their check because it's life and death for many people, mm -hmm. particularly people or hourly wage people who, in fact, are trying to figure out how they can pay their mortgage, how they can keep their rent if they don't have a home, how they pay their rent. And so that's really important. We focus on that. And I'm we're all putting a lot of pressure on the administration to figure out how to mechanically implement what's going on here. And there's a last piece. If, in fact, you are uh, if you're in a situation where you are making a family of four making less than basically $125,000 a year, everyone in that family would get, the husband and wife would each get a $1,200 direct cash payment from the IRS, and for each child you get $500. So if you're making, a, say, $125,000 and you're a family of four, the children each get $500, that's $1,000, and you each get $1,200, so that's $3,400 would come into the family. But the problem is they haven't set the mechanisms up. And so it's all about implementation. And so a lot of us are putting as much emphasis and pressure on making sure this money gets out. There's an urgency to it. I'm sorry to go on so long, but a lot of people don't okay. know that what, what they have to do to qualify to get this done. I appreciate it. One more thing I want to add. Um, thank you so much for honoring our fathers. They're the ones that served in the military. We were just military brats. So I don't want to, I don't want to give them and take credit for their service to this country. Um, you, served so you served too. Yeah, you no, served too. Yeah, you served too. You know, yeah, there's a famous expression from the poet Keats. He said, they also serve, but only stand and wait. When Bo was in Iraq in the middle of a war, Every morning I'd go in before she'd go to school, she'd be standing over the sink, drinking her coffee and saying a prayer. So every single person. So it goes for the kids too, but thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you so much, Judy and Benji um, for those questions. Uh, sadly, we're the, wrapping up the Q&A part of this. Um, I wanna thank all the families for participating, Dr. Murphy as well. Um, it is so important to get accurate information out there during these very challenging times. Um, I've really enjoyed having the opportunity to be part of this conversa conversation with all of you.
Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Vice President Biden who has a few words to close this out. You have anything to say, baby? No, go ahead. Well, look, um, the American people are absolutely, uh, really and truly incredible. You know, I, I, I started off when I decided to run. I said I was. we had to restore the soul of America. We're seeing the soul of America come out now. We're seeing people reach deep down and helping other people. We're seeing the idea that it's not just me. It's something bigger than me. It's bigger than us. It's about all of us. And we're going to get through this. We really are. And we're going to come out better for it. But we can't forget the people. We can't forget the people who get hurt. People will get hurt in this process. Families will get hurt. And any of you who've lost a son, a daughter, a husband, wife, you know what it's like. It's just this giant void. And we have to be sensitive to the people who had losses, but embrace them. And But they're going to be okay, too, because whoever they lost is still inside them, still part of them. But we got to remember, a lot of people are hurting. A lot of people are going to be hurt when this is over. And we've got to make them whole. And we can. We can. That's what we do in the United States. That's what the United States does. That's what makes me so darn proud to be an American and look at that flag on your chest. Really. Thank you all. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye. You guys are great. Thank you.